Song of Solomon, chapter 3. Turn with me. Just like we have watched Corey and Topanga, we have watched this couple in Song of Solomon as they have been attracted to one another, as they have dated one another, as they have courted each other. And each step along the way, their desire for each other grows more and more and more. If you will look at the last verse of chapter 2, she says, Until the day breeze and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on cleft mountains. On my bed by night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. The watchmen found me and they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go. Their desire for each other continues to grow and blossom more and more and more. And they have honored God in every step of the way, in every stage. They have stayed pure. They have saved themselves sexually for marriage. And look at what happens in verse 5 of chapter 3. Uh, for, end of verse 4, I'm sorry. It says, and I brought him into my mother's house, into the chamber of her who conceived me. This is her taking her beloved to her mother to get her family's blessing to marry this man. So we've gone from attraction to dating to courtship and now to marriage. And that's where we are tonight. We are at their wedding. Their wedding starts in chapter 3, verse 6. And what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you six aspects of a God-honoring marriage. All right? Six aspects of a God-honoring marriage that we see symbolically laid out for us at this wedding. Now, all of them are going to start with S, but I could not find an S word to substitute, substitute in for celebration, so you're just going to get all S sounds, okay? They're all S's. If you want to spell celebration with an S, you can do it. That way there are all six S's, but they are all S sounds. I've got six of them. Look at verse 6 of chapter 3. Get your Bibles out. Look at verse 6 of chapter 3. Here's what it says. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Look at that first part again. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke? Smoke in the wilderness. This is language that should take our minds Back to the Exodus. Do you remember in the Exodus, you had a pillar of cloud or a pillar of smoke that guided Israel wherever they should go. And when we're using this language poetically of what is that coming out of the wilderness, it looks like a columns of smoke coming out of the wilderness. This is a poetic way of saying that this is God's blessing upon what's happening. God is here in the midst of this wedding. God is blessing this wedding. The first thing I want you to see is that a godly wedding is divinely sanctioned. Okay, It is blessed by God. A marriage of two people who love the Lord and desire to be committed to each other, that wedding is, and that marriage is blessed and sanctioned by God. 
Let me make something very clear. It is not a living arrangement of people who say they love each other and just want to live with one another. God is not honored with you living with your boyfriend or girlfriend or fiance if you are not married. God is not honored in it. Let me repeat that so that you can write that down. God is not honored with you living with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your fiance. This is not a living arrangement. This is a covenant. They are entering into a covenant. By the way, let me give you some statistics. 80% of couples that live together before they get married get divorced. 80% of couples that live together before they're married end in divorce. 60% of couples that get married by a judge at a courthouse get divorced. 40% of couples that get married in a church get divorced. But then watch this. When both the husband and wife claim to study their Bible on a weekly basis. Now notice, it doesn't say just read. It says study their Bible. When a marriage has two people who love Jesus and are studying their Bible on a weekly basis, the divorce rate drops to 0.09%. Less than 1% of marriages where the couple say, we study God's word, get divorced. You see, there's a way that God wants this done. He wants a husband and a wife who love him and cherish him and care about obeying him being joined together in a covenant. Not a living arrangement. Not just, let's just get married and see what happens. No, two people who are coming together in covenant. By the way, do you know who invented marriage? Man didn't invent marriage. God did. God invented it. God is the one who made up this marriage covenant. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 25, you have this in your notes in front of you. Here's what happens. So the Lord God, God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. He's already made the man out of the dust of the ground, and then he causes man to go to sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, then he closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And listen to this. Therefore, this is God. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. God invented marriage. It was his idea, and it is between one man and one woman for a lifetime. The second thing I want you to see about a God honoring. The second thing I want you to see about a God honoring marriage is that it's a celebration. At the second part of verse six, it says that that she is perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and the fragrant powders of a merchant. You only get this dolled up if you're celebrating something. This is what you do if you're celebrating something. They have dated, they have courted properly, and now they are going to have a wedding and they are going to celebrate their love for one another. Now, I want to say something about this. This is what a wedding should be, right? A wedding should be a celebration of two people who love each other, right? God loves us, that allows us to love one another, and we are going to have a celebration of our love. But let me make something very clear. You do not stop, you don't stop celebrating your marriage on your wedding day. Your entire marriage should be a celebration of your love. That's why we celebrate anniversaries. 
That's why we, we date even though we're married. We go out on dates. We go to dinner with one another. We, we spend time with one another. We, we consummate our, our, our marriage, which we're going to talk about last week, I mean next week. We, we're intimate sexually together. That continues throughout the entire marriage as a celebration of our love. Our love, be quiet, our love is celebrated. A marriage should be celebrated. Not just once on the wedding day, but every day of a godly marriage. Number two. Uh, number three. It offers safety. Look at verses seven and eight. Behold the litter of Solomon. Now, some translations will translate that couch of Solomon. Here's what's happening. This woman is being carried on Solomon's royal couch. Couch. And notice what it says. It says around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and experts in war, each with his sword at his thigh against terror by the night. Here's what has happened. Solomon has taken his own personal royal couch. He has sent 60 men to go get his bride. She is now on the couch, and these 60 men have escorted her from her home to the palace. So coming out of the wilderness is his bride. And she is being protected by 60 of Solomon's mighty men of war. All of them armed. You need to stop talking and listen. All of them armed. A proper marriage offers safety and security for both the husband and the wife. You may not have 60 armed guards that you can send to protect your spouse. I don't have men at my disposal that right now my wife is home. She has not felt good the last three days. She's had a stomach bug. I am here. There is no way that I have the ability to sit, send 60 armed men to surround my home and protect her when I'm not there. Right? They're just, they just, they're all got machine guns and they're just standing around the house. Like, what is this about? Well, Neil sent us. I don't know. We're protecting Jessica. You don't have the ability to do that. I don't have the ability to do that. So how do we protect one another? How do we protect one another in a marriage? Here's the number one way that you protect and that you keep your spouse safe. You look them on the in the face the very first day that you get married and you say, I love you till death do us part. I will never leave you or forsake you or divorce you. That is the number one way that you keep your spouse safe is that they don't have to wonder whether or not your heart is theirs. You look each other in the face on that wedding day and you say, I do. For better, for worse, in sickness and in health, in richer or for poor until death do us part. I love you. I will never leave you. I will never divorce you. That, when you've got a, a couple that look each other in the face and recommit to that every day, that is a marriage that honors God. It is a marriage that provides safety. Number four. Verse 9, King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. This is a palaquin. Now, how many of you, you've probably seen this in movies, okay? Have you ever seen the thing where you have the, the royal guards, there's long poles on either side, and they're carrying, usually up on their shoulder like this, they're carrying these poles, and then they have this, area where somebody is sitting and it's covered the whole thing's covered they've got a seat inside and they're sitting inside and they're being carried on that thing you ever seen that in a movie before right this is what this carriage is here all right they this woman is inside of solomon's couch and she's sitting on solomon's couch but solomon's couch is covered and the and the 60 men or at least some of the men are carrying this from her home to her house. And notice what it says that it's made of. 
the wood of Lebanon. This was, at the time, the best wood you could possibly get. And, and the reason why it was so valuable and the reason why it was so rare and so expensive is because it was so strong. Solomon's carriage for this woman is made of the strongest wood possible. A godly marriage, a marriage that honors God is a strong marriage. Here's the main reason why it's strong, okay? The main reason why it is strong is because you have a husband and a wife who love Jesus and are fixed in their will, in their heart, in their mind. They are fixed and they are steadfast in building this marriage on Jesus. That's what makes it strong. That's what makes it strong is they are dedicated to working on this marriage no matter what. Now, listen to me. Will there be foxes that get inside a marriage to try to destroy the vineyard that we talked about last week? Yes, yes you can't keep them out. There are going to be things that happen inside of marriage. You are going to fight in your marriage. You are going to have disagreements. A husband and a wife will sin against each other. That does not mean the marriage is not strong. Because if you've got a husband and a wife that love Jesus and are dedicated to running those foxes out, to reconciling when the ruptures happen, they are going to work on this marriage and build this marriage until it is as strong as it can possibly be. A godly marriage is strong because it is built the right way. It is built on the Lord. Number five, verse 10. The post of this carriage are silver, its back gold, and its seat purple. So here's what he's done. He has covered this wood in silver and gold. He has made it with great splendor. This isn't just an average carriage that you see coming to the palace. This is a gorgeous, splendorous carriage. It is made of silver and gold. And what color is the couch? Purple. It's the color of royalty. Let me give you two reasons why it is of great splendor. Number one, they have not settled for anything other than a godly spouse. If you settle, teenagers, listen to me. If you settle for someone who is not a godly spouse pursuing Jesus, you're going to pay for it. You hear me? You're going to pay for it. You'll never be able to build that marriage the way it should be built. If only one of you love Jesus, if only one of you is trying to build it, it's never going to be built the way it needs to be built. They have not settled. They chose well. And because they desire, because they've done this, they desire for their marriage to honor God. What is the greatest way a Christian marriage can honor God? What is the greatest way that a Christian marriage can honor God? It is a picture of the gospel. It is a picture of Christ and the church. That is what makes a marriage so splendid. That is what makes a marriage have so much splendor. Is that a godly marriage is one that desires to be a picture for the world of Christ and his church. Look at Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 in your notes. This is Paul writing, and he says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. 
Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Who He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and he cherishes it just like Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Now listen to this last part. He quotes Genesis chapter two that we read earlier. Listen to what he says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Now listen to what he says. This mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to to Christ and the church. Why did God create marriage? What is the ultimate reason marriage was created? It wasn't for the husband. It wasn't for the wife. Ultimately, it is to be a picture of the gospel. Marriage exists to be a picture of Christ and the church. That's why God made it. That is its splendor. So when you got a husband and a wife that are dedicated to, to making sure this marriage honors God, it is going to be a splendid picture of Christ in the church. And then last, number 11, or verse 11, number six, it is sublime. Here's what I mean by sublime. Sublime means high, lofty, or above. Verse 11 Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding. This is not the crown of him being king. This was a probably a wreath that was put upon his head by his mother on his wedding day. And they're saying, go look at how high our king looks on this day. Go look at this marriage and see how high and lofty this marriage is. Now, I want to say a couple things and we'll, we'll be done. I do not say what I'm about to say to be prideful or arrogant. I say this because it needs to be true. Listen to me very carefully. A Christian marriage should be better than a lost person's marriage. A Christian marriage should be higher or more lofty than a non-Christian marriage. Because the couple, the Christian couple, is determined to love each other like Jesus. It is a shame when a Christian marriage doesn't look any different or any better or any higher or any loftier than a non-Christian marriage. That is a shame. And I'm not saying that there can't be good non-Christian marriages. I'm just saying a godly marriage that is doing it right should be high and lofty above a lost person's marriage. Lost couples don't have a desire to honor Jesus in their marriage. It will never glorify God like two Christians married who are fixed upon having a godly marriage. So here's what we have. We've got their attraction to one another. And remember, you better be attracted to people of good character because one day someone you're attracted to is going to be marrying you. You better pick somebody with some high character. Then you begin to date that person. You begin to spend some on-purpose time with them. And as you get to know them better and better and more and more, you may move into a courtship situation. That courtship situation is you are now making plans. This could be the person I spend the rest of my life with. And at some point you'll get engaged. That's still part of the courtship, but you'll get engaged. 
And girls, you will walk down an aisle and your husband will be standing at the end of that aisle waiting for you to come to him. Men, you will be standing there waiting for your bride to walk down that aisle to join you in marriage. But I want you to listen very closely to me. You have got to make sure you are marrying somebody who loves Jesus. I'll, I'll end with this illustration and then um, we'll be done. Tommy Nelson, in his, when he was preaching through this series, uh, he said, I get asked all the time, how do you know who to date? How do you know who to date? Here's what he said. Listen carefully. He said, you run after Jesus as fast and as hard as you can. Look at me. You run after Jesus as fast and as hard as you can. You get and you and you just chase Jesus. And you look to your right and you look to your left and you find, girls, some boy who's running after Jesus like you are. Guys, you look to your right and your left and you see some girl who's running after Jesus like you are. And you invite them on over and you, you keep running together. Because one day, you're going to run together into marriage. And the way that it works is when a husband and a wife love Jesus with all their heart and they want a God-honoring marriage. That's what we have before of us, before us in Song of Solomon chapter 3, is we have this couple now celebrating their marriage. Next week, honeymoon. You know what happens on a honeymoon? Sex. Next week, sex. We will talk about the art of intimacy.